Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Dementia Researcher podcast. I'm monthly blogger Dr. Sam Moxon, returning once again to host the podcast, and on this episode, I sit down with author and gastroenterologist Dr. Alan Desmond to talk about the links between the gut microbiome and dementia. Can the billions of bacteria that occupy your gut really have an impact on your brain? This was a really interesting discussion. We talked about the gut microbiome, why it's important, and delved into some of the recent scientific breakthroughs of how changes in the bacteria of your gut can possibly directly cause the progression of dementia. So stick around and sit back with your favourite brew and enjoy. Dr. Arne Desmond, welcome to the Dementia Researcher podcast. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to start with the most important question, which is, how are you today? Sam, I'm good, man. I'm very good. I'm in what I usually refer to as my one hour post porridge and coffee optimum. So I had a nice <laughs> bowl of porridge for breakfast earlier with a little bit of, um, little bit of peanut butter, uh, some fruit in there and a cup of coffee. And usually about an hour after that, I'm at my optimum. So you've got me at my best. That's odd because I, I've had exactly the same for breakfast. Oh, no, uh, really? Oh, yeah, it was like snap. flax seed, chai seed, soy milk, all that kind of stuff. Lovely. It's a great oh, way to start snap. the day. Yeah, so, so basically we're set up to absolutely smash this conversation. Yeah, it does, it does help. You do, you do get like a nice energy boost. Um, I'm not sure how much of it is the coffee and how much of it is the carbs, but you, feel, you do feel great. Um, you certainly do. I, I saw some very inter- really interesting paper recently about the mood boosting potential of peanut butter. Um, so as a big peanut butter fan, I've always found that after consuming peanut butter, I just get this little mood enhancement, you know, yeah. um, but it's probably just one cog in a big machine, right? Especially I love, I love Marmite peanut butter as well, which I know isn't for everybody, but you mix, uh, mix a bit of B12 in there and it's just delicious. Yeah. Love it or hate it. I'm a fan. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what well, should we start then um, by you outlining to our listeners uh, who you are and what you do? Oh, thanks, Sam. So I'm Dr. Alan Desmond. I work in the UK National Health Service, NHS. Um, I'm a gastroenterologist. So I see and treat patients with significant gastrointestinal problems. And, you know, in the in high income countries and thanks to our 21st century diet and lifestyle, doctors like me are very, very busy because conditions like diverticular disease, bowel cancer, precancerous polyps, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease have become so prevalent in countries like the UK, the US, Australia, Europe, that, they've re- that they're almost regarded as normal, Sam. So there's, sadly, there's plenty of work for gastroenterologists to do. We are, never, we are never not busy. But in addition to being a practicing full-time gastroenterologist, I'm also a um, very vocal advocate for the power of healthier approaches to food in enhancing our digestive health, helping to protect us from developing serious digestive health problems, but also helping us to improve our prognosis if we are diagnosed with a serious digestive health problem. And because of the experience that I have had while trying to get evidence-based answers for my patients, when they ask their gastroenterologist, what should I eat, doctor? Which every patient does. Because of my feeling of a duty of care that I should have evidence-based answers to that question. What should I eat, doctor? So all the way through my training, and particularly since I became a consultant or attending or whatever you want to call it in 2012, um, I've always been interested to find evidence-based answers to that question. So as well as reading and scouring the medical journals for all the latest information on colonoscopic techniques and polypectomy, and medications and, you know, uh, anti-TNF drugs and biologic drugs and all those wonderful tools that we as gastroenterologists have at our disposal. I've always read the papers with great interest on the effect of food on our digestive health. What we eat is an incredibly important determinant of our digestive health. A lot of that has to do with the makeup of the food, the constituents of the food, the nutritional profile of the food, but also very much to do with the effect that those foods have on our gut microbial health. And although all of that science and theory is fascinating and interesting, and I love getting deep into it, for me, Sam, as a doctor who is willing to talk to his patients about food, and give them evidence-based answers and encourage them 
to unprocess and eat more plant-based foods as part of their management uh, plan. The transformations I've seen and the benefits I've seen and the positive feedback I've had from my patients time and time and time again has led me to, you know, being an advocate. And that's why we're here to talk today. That's why I do other interviews. I wrote a book about this last year, which came out in January. Um, so as well as being a full-time NHS gastroenterologist, I'm also now an author and an advocate and an ambassador for health professionals, excuse me, Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, which is a UK-based organization, which aims to educate patients, the public, healthcare providers, and policymakers on the benefits of unprocessing our diet, eating more plants, and pushing back against the standard Western diet. That's fantastic. And, and that's the, a good thing, a good way to lean into what the topic is today, which we're going to be talking about the, the gut-brain axis and the links between uh, digestive health and brain health. And uh, I know you mentioned your book. I'd like to give that a shout out at the start of the podcast, um, The Plant-Based Diet Revolution. I am an advocate of that book. You talked about inflammatory bowel disease. Um, I was diagnosed in January. Oh, um, really? Oh, my I, goodness. Sorry to hear that, man. Well, that's the thing, though. I, I don't really think need, people need to apologize to me anymore because, because since switching to more plant-based and following particularly the recipes in your book, I don't feel like I have it anymore. It's very strange. Uh, so it's, it really does make a difference. I think there's a lot of scope for combining medicine and diet. So I'm on an anti-TNF and also um, follow a plant-based diet. And I find that when I do that strictly, I, f I feel normal. I feel fine. And you know, Sam, we're not here specifically to talk about inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and colitis, no. but I have to tell you, those are the conditions that first um, uh, convinced me that I wanted to be a gastroenterologist. So back in 2004, I was three years out of med school. I'd done my internship, as we called it in Ireland. And I was working as a senior house officer. And as a young doctor, you know, in your early 20s, you get used to the idea that the patients that you take care of in the hospital are generally a lot older than you. OK, they're generally in their 60s, 70s and 80s. And as a young person in your 20s, that kind of makes sense to you because you have learned that as we get older, we accumulate chronic diseases. We develop, you know, cancers. We have strokes. We have heart attacks. We develop dementia and we need hospital care. But when I went through my first rotation in gastroenterology, I was surprised to find there was patients on the GI ward that were my age and younger. And instead of being at university or at home or starting a business or working in a job or at home with their families, they were in hospital on intravenous steroids and we were giving them immune suppressants like um, adalimumab or at the time it would have been infliximab actually, that was the first licensed biologic drug for IBD. And the first thing I noticed was that we could do so much good for these individuals by getting their medications right, et cetera, but also that they always asked us about food, Sam. And at the time, I, I remember very clearly, and I, I mentioned this in my book as well, I can remember like it was yesterday being at the bedside of a young man with Crohn's disease, newly diagnosed, and he'd been hospitalized with terribly difficult digestive sy symptoms. And he was on intravenous steroids. He's about three days into that. The biomarkers were getting better. His CRP was coming down. His symptoms were improving. So we were on the ward round and the news was good. You know, my boss told him, look, the markers are getting better. Um, you're not going to need surgery to remove part of your bowels. That's good news. Uh, we're going to start you on a new biologic drug tomorrow, which was infliximab. And that man, that young man asked us as his team, what about food doctor? He said, you know, my appetite's coming back. Is there anything I should be eating or avoiding? And he looked at us in askance because he was wondering, are there any foods that I should eat or eat to improve my prognosis? Not just now, but you guys have just told me I'm going to have this disease for the rest of my life. Is there anything, you know, is there any foods I should be making a habit for the rest of my life to improve my prognosis? And at the time, my boss, 2004, I believe, says to this young man, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Eat whatever you like. Um, you need calories right now to heal. And he, the young man was surprised. His mother was there with him uh, at the bedside. She was surprised. My boss said, does he like McDonald's? Why don't you bring him to McDonald's? We need to get some more calories into this boy. And, you know, at that time, Sam, that was very much the mainstream thinking within medicine. But thank God now, 20 years later, we recognize that food is incredibly important, not just for inflammatory bowel disease patients, Crohn's and colitis patients. And we have seen studies that when we combine the best available medications with a healthy plant-centric unprocessed diet, we can, we can get incredible enhancement of the effects of biologic drugs, getting 
remission rates up from 30 or 40 percent up to 80, 90, 95 percent. But not only is food so important for patients with digestive health problems, of course, it goes way beyond that, right? So in, yeah. in medicine right now, I think there's a growing recognition that the food we consume is an incredibly important determinant of our health and longevity. In the UK right now, we know from the global burden of disease studies that the foods that we consume on a daily basis in the United Kingdom cause more healthy years of life lost every year than lack of exercise, than alcohol consumption, than wow. illicit drug use. In the United States, the food that people consume is the number one reason for loss of healthy years lived. In the UK, it's still number two to cigarettes. But yeah. we, as doctors, when our patients want to achieve full health, yes, we've got amazing medications, we've got amazing surgery, but we need to be talking to our patients about food. And I'm really glad to hear that you are getting the best evidence-based medication right now and you're taking the best evidence-based approach to food right now and you're reaping the benefits. And actually that's that's um, a good segue in, into sort of getting into the meat of this. So obviously you're, you're used to dealing with conditions that are associated with changes in, in the gut microbiome. And the, the sort of, the, the idea for this podcast came around when I was looking through literature at things that I should be doing to try and rebalance my, my gut uh, microbiota. Mm. And I saw studies on links between the gut microbiome and dementia, and we'll get into that later. But um, mm. I just want to start by asking you, basically, what is the gut microbiome for those who aren't aware of it? And, and how, why is it important? And particularly, why is it important when we think about brain health? Well, you know, the science on gut microbial health and the role of the bugs that live in our digestive system predominantly has really, um, you know, has really come into the forefront and into the mainstream in the last 20 years. Now, I was very lucky as way back when I was, you know, training in medical school and in my early training as a guy to become a gastroenterologist, um, you know, in the early to mid 2000s and up to 2010, et cetera. Um, I was very lucky early in my training to be under the mentorship of some of the world's leading gut microbiome researchers, uh, Professor Raymond uh, Quigley, Professor Fergus Shannon. And I was very lucky for two years as a postgrad to work at uh, APC Microbiome Ireland, one of the world's leading microbiome research centers. So the role of the gut microbiome in human health and digestive health has always been there in my thinking. You know, when I was learning how to do colonoscopy, the first time I ever did those tests, I was taking samples from the lining of patients' large bowels to get microbiome samples because they were taking part in a study on the role of the gut microbiome in inflammatory bowel disease. So what is the gut microbiome? Well, you know, uh, we are not alone, Sam, okay? So on an individual basis, we are not, we think of ourselves as being single organisms, okay? Human beings have been, been around probably for 200,000 years. We've been evolving for 9 million years. But within our digestive system, predominantly in our large bowel, we are carrying about 100 trillion microbes, bacteria, viruses, yeasts, and archaea. Now, as I said, humans have been around maybe, I don't know, one or 200,000 years, but those microbes have been on planet Earth for about two to four billion years. They were Earth's first living life forms, okay? And we evolved in parallel to those microbes. I often say to people, the very first cell, the very first mammalian cell, human cell, that evolved on planet Earth was actually part of the Earth's microbiome. It was surrounded by other microbes, okay? So why is that relevant? Because in 2021, every single human is carrying these microbes in our digestive system. We, they contain as many cells as the human body, probably a hundred times more genetic material than the human body. On an individual basis, our gut microbiome begins to form at birth, possibly just before birth. There's some science showing now that even in the womb, we have a gut microbiome, but it really takes off when we're born. So microbes are in the environment. So with that first breath of air, that first human touch, that first sip of breast milk, our gut microbiome begins to develop. In fact, uh, the breast milk that we get for our very first meal contains carbohydrates that cannot be digested by humans but can help to promote the growth of a healthy gut microbiome. So breast oh, wow. milk, a part of the things that, one of the things that breast milk does is it helps to seed our digestive tract by promoting the growth of the microbes that reside within our digestive tract. And that's really important because as we are growing and developing as little tiny babies, 
our gut microbes play a crucial role in the development of a healthy GI tract, an immune system, a healthy body. And as grown-ups, as human adults, our gut microbiome remains a control center for human biology. And we know that a healthy and thriving gut microbiome has been a critical part of being a healthy human being for millennia, right? But in the 21st century, it's come up with against this adversary, the standard Western diet, a high meat, high processed meat, high animal fat, high dairy, low fiber, low plant, low plant diversity approach to eating. Um, And whenever we sit down to eat a meal on a daily basis, we have some power here, Sam, because we can ask ourselves as we choose what we're eating for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we can think, what sort of gut microbiome am I building today? Because the foods we consume on a daily basis as grown-ups, as adults, is one of the main determinants of whether the healthy bacteria that help us to flourish and thrive, flourish and thrive within the gut microbiome, or whether the unhealthy gut microbes that produce a gut microbial environment that is conducive to disease states, whether they flourish and thrive. I remember speaking to my old mentor, Uh, Professor Fergus Shanahan, uh, one of the world's leading gut microbiome uh, researchers now retired. And I spoke to him a few years ago and told him about the the concept for the book I was writing. And he said, you know, Alan, that's fantastic. I can't wait to read it. He said, the top three determinants of our gut microbial health are food, food, and food. Now there's other things important too, but it it just feeds into the whole conversation I had earlier or the points we made earlier. As doctors, we need to be talking to our patients about food and that's so important for digestive health. So important for gut microbial health. And not just, you know, obviously it's natural to think about that when you think about digestive disorders, but as we learned in the episode with Neil Bernard, it's also things like uh, neurological disorders where diet's important. And before we get into sort of the science, which which I'll cover uh, behind the gut microbiome links to dementia, um, I've also seen studies, and you mentioned it in the book, that actually when people start to consume a diet that optimizes uh, the good uh, bacteria in your gut and nurtures the microbiome, you see improvements in things like mood, decision making, sleep patterns. Uh, and so we know that the, you know, the bacteria in the gut produce things like uh, neurotransmitters, things like dopamine, mm-hmm. acetylcholine, GABA, which are critical for these functions. So it's not just the stomach that, that requires a healthy microbiome. You know, it's, it's the rest of the body and, and particularly interesting to us is the brain. So the question I wanted to ask you is, obviously you deal with patients who are in essence trying to improve their gut microbiome and trying to improve mm-hmm. their digestive symptoms. But as this happens, do they see improvements in things like mood, cognitive function? Do they sleep better? Do, do you see some of these neurological benefits as well? On a kind of a a very day-to-day basis. I mean, Sam, I've been very lucky over the years to work with patients in my clinic. I've run various like challenges where I've helped people to unprocess their diet, eat more plants, move to this ultra healthy version of a Mediterranean diet, which we call a whole food plant-based diet. Um, So over the years, I've been very lucky to be in a position to help thousands of people to embrace this way of eating, right? And I've worked with colleagues and friends and other doctors and dietitians, chefs, et cetera, that have helped to make that happen. But when I check in, and this conversation happens all the time, okay? So whatever reason a person embraces this healthier approach to food, whether they're looking to achieve a healthier body weight, lower their cholesterol, improve their digestive health, or whether they're doing it for environmental concerns, animal rights concerns, whether they're doing it to reduce the risk of a future global pandemic uh, from another zoonotic virus jumping from the food chain into humans, whatever the reason they do it. When you speak to them, maybe six or eight weeks in, very often they say things like, I feel happier, I feel lighter, I feel more energetic. I mean, there's a a friend of mine who's a well-known UK chef and he'd been eating a kind of a relatively meat heavy diet for many years. And he made the change to a whole food plant-based diet last year. And we were texting and I was getting a little bit of support and getting into the nutritional aspects and, you know, getting into the the woods on nutrients, et cetera. But after six or eight weeks, I checked in with him, said, how are you doing? He said, I'm being nicer to people. Yeah. So, so in the book, I refer to this as the happiness effect. And we see it time and time again. I see it all the time in my practice. And of course, there's plenty of research that backs this up. I mean, in the, in the US right now, 
the official dietary guidelines for patients diagnosed with type 2 diabetes is to help them to eat a, a predominantly plant-based diet, an unprocessed plant-based diet, Mediterranean or vegetarian diet, right? And one yeah. of the reasons for that is that there was a huge um, review of the evidence published maybe about three years ago in the BMJ, and they looked at outcomes um, and the effects of a plant-based diet, the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And they looked at studies from like the US, Europe, uh, Australasia, et cetera. And alongside better blood sugar control and or you know, fewer overall symptoms of diabetes, the patients who made that switch very much in a statistically significant way reported great um, improved psychological well-being, better day, better uh, quality of life, et cetera. So the evidence tells us that this is real. And the, our gut microbes certainly seem to have a role to play in it, although the science on that is emerging. And if we're going to think about this, we need to think about or understand the microbiome gut brain axis. Okay. Yeah. So, this is a really complex system which allows our gut microbes, our digestive system, and our brains to communicate with each other. Now, people understand the concept of a gut brain connection intuitively. So, if, you're, if you've got a, an exam to do, if you're under stress, et cetera, you can develop butterflies in your tummy. Um, you get a feeling of nervousness in your belly. Yeah. If you witness um, something very stressful, you might feel nauseous. You might lose your appetite. You might become constipated for a day or two after a stressful event. So these are very real life examples of how our emotional health affects our digestive health. But this communication runs in two directions through nerves, hormones, other signaling mechanisms. And someone recently asked me, how many messages travel between your brain and your gut every day? But in fact, rather than think of it as messages, I like to think of it as a kind of a constant two-way live stream of information. Yeah. So they are communicating with each other all the time. And there's an emerging body of research that tells us how our gut microbes uh, or measures how our gut microbes may influence um, our mood or our decision-making, et cetera. I mean, we've seen some really fascinating studies showing that if you simply take a bunch of volunteers and give them high doses of a probiotic mix of gut-friendly bacteria, um, you can help to reduce symptoms of stress. You can even generate changes on functional MRI scan oh, wow. in terms of how people's brains are working. We've seen studies showing that by, by promoting the growth of healthy gut microbes, um, volunteers who report reduced symptoms of stress and anxiety, report improved memory and cognition, and lower levels of stress hormones, even, even data on sleep, right? Now, yeah. a lot of those studies have been done um, within the probiotic industry or the supplement industry. But of course, the good news is the the growth of healthy bacteria within your digestive system it isn't dependent on a constant supply of an expensive probiotic supplement. No. It's dependent on a constant supply of a variety of unpro unprocessed plants and different types of plant fiber. Um, so, yeah, the, I mean, the studies that I read about the effect of eating more plants and having a healthier gut microbiome on your mood and cognition really reflect what I see on a day-to-day -day basis. But we're learning more all the time, Sam. I mean, there was a, there was a study published last year uh, which made the headlines and it said, it showed the headlines were along the line of your gut microbes can make you depressed, okay? Because yeah. the media love a negative headline. Okay? Yeah, it, yeah, you could <laughs> but, have spun that, you could so, have spun that the, the other way, which is yeah, you, 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 you can make yourself feel better with... <laughs> exactly, exactly. But of course the headlines were the gut microbes that make you feel depressed, okay? But what that study was, was um, it was a study that had shown that people with adequate levels of certain bacteria in their gut microbiome were also more likely to have a better quality of life yeah. and less likely to suffer from depression. Now, the bacteria subtypes that they spoke about were Fistobacteria and Coprococcus. Now, those happen to be two bacteria that are among the fiber-loving bacteria that are known to thrive on a fiber-rich, plant-rich diet. And the main job among the main jobs of those particular bacteria is turning fiber that you get from plants into a short chain fatty acid called butyrate. 
Okay. So short chain fatty acids produced by your gut microbiome optimally when you eat a high fiber diet. We know that individuals who eat a vegan or vegetarian diet uh, produce more butyrate than people who eat an omnivorous diet. So that butyrate chemical, which is made by your gut microbiome when you eat a healthy diet, helps to reduce chronic inflammation in your gut, helps to knock off precancer cells in the lining of your colon, um, provides 70% of the energy to the enterocytes that line mm -hmm. your digestive system, enters your bloodstream, helps control your blood sugar, helps to control your appetite, and enters your cerebrospinal fluid. Yeah. And butyrate can be detected in your CSF. And there's emerging data showing that butyrate this chemical that is made by your gut microbes when you eat porridge and fruit and peanut butter for breakfast <laughs> enters your enters your cerebrospinal fluid and plays a role in helping to maintain the health of your brain blood barrier yeah which is incredibly important for maintaining your long term neurological health so for me as a kind of a gut microbiome nerd and a gut health doctor it's really fascinating to me to look at the science which is in its infancy, really. Um, but it's fascinating to discover that the same um, fiber-loving gut microbes that protect our physical health and our digestive health may play an equally important role in protecting our psychological well-being and even our cognitive well-being. That's fascinating. And I'm really glad you mentioned butyrate because that takes me nicely into looking into the science behind the links between the gut microbiome and dementia. Um, so over the last couple of years, there have been you know, studies uh, uh, released and some of them made the headlines showing that, that the changes in, in the microbiome can be associated with Alzheimer's. And at first there were questions around whether this was a cause or an effect of the disease. Um, I know my grandfather was recently diagnosed with dementia and sometimes it can be difficult to get him to eat what's on his plate. And so one of the questions was, is this just an effect of the disease? But as, uh, scientists probed further what was going on, we found significant changes in the gut microbiota of patients with Alzheimer's that weren't just a, an effect of the disease, but could it be the cause? So if you'd let me, I'd like to run through some of those changes and see oh, if- please, these, yeah. These I, sounds I, I'd, familiar I'd, to you. Yep, I'd love to hear more about it, man. It's, it's fascinating stuff. I love, anyone who's happy to go into the weeds on gut microbiome research, I will sit <laughs> here and listen. Awesome. Well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of mechanisms. I've picked a select few that I think are perhaps most relevant. So uh, a couple of studies have shown that things like uh, bacterial products of the intestinal microbiota are correlated with the quantity of amyloid plaques in the brain. Now, uh, we know amyloid plaques are one of the main disease uh, markers for Alzheimer's disease. And usually by the time a patient's developed a lot of amyloid plaques and is diagnosed, it's too late to action any sort of therapy. So finding things that could be causing that, those increases in, in amyloid uh, fibrillogenesis could be ways to try and prevent the disease. And so they looked into this a little bit further, and this is why I'm glad you mentioned butyrate, because what they mm -hmm. essentially found was, uh, firstly, the gut microbiota, as you probably know, uh, are a significant source of amyloids. They produce their own amyloids. And uh, from what I understand, it's, it sort of helps them to bind to each other and form biofilms. And it's a different type of amyloid to that that's found in the brain, but it's thought that an increased amount of amyloid production in the microbiota can prime the immune system to react to brain amyloid in an inflammatory way and start to kick, kickstart some of those mechanisms. But, but more than just that, um, I feel like I'm preaching to, to the choir here when I talk about bacterial lipopolysaccharides, uh, things like um, acetate and, and valerate, increased production of those was also found to increase the formation of amyloid plaques. And interestingly, high levels of butyrate were associated with less amyloid pathology. So it seems the more butyrate producing bacteria you have in your gut, the less amyloid pathology you have. Whereas if you have uh, bacteria that are producing things like acetate and valerate, the, that goes up. And it also falls uh, hand in hand with an increased leaky gut uh, in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So as the barrier in the gut becomes compromised and more neurotoxic things can get into the bloodstream, you also see this, this effect. So a lot of different mechanisms going on, but the, 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 key, the key sort of message that I got from this is if you've got a microbiome that's full of fiber-loving bacteria that are producing lots of butyrate, you've got a much lower 
chance of having any form of amyloid pathology and then progressing into dementia. So does that sound like a familiar story to you when it comes to other diseases you've looked at? Well, it sounds like a very familiar story. I mean, yes, it, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, when we look at the foods that help to promote a healthy gut microbiome, help to prevent things like colon cancer, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, when we look at the foods that help to prevent cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, we keep coming up with the same answers, don't we? Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, legumes, seeds, uh, plant-based oils, polyunsaturated fats. And of course, there's so many reasons why consuming these foods can help to protect our vascular health, our neurological health. And that's to do with you know, phytonutrients, uh, low saturated fat content, absence of animal protein, presence of plant protein. But the mechanisms that you've described um, really make sense to me. And you mentioned the concept of leaky gut. And that is something that I'm asked about all the time. So there's, a, there's two things that are interesting in terms of preventing a leaky gut. Now, your gut, as you know, Sam, is supposed to be a little bit leaky. Yeah. Your small bowel, is, it's, its main uh, purpose in life is to absorb nutrients. Humans digest food, whatever we eat, we go through this digestive process, which is an integ integral part to being a healthy human. We take the foods, we chew, we break them down. We want to turn them into their basic constituents, amino acids, simple carbohydrates, fats, so we can absorb them. So our small intestine is the place where these nutrients and um, you know, things like iron and magnesium and copper get absorbed. That's what our digestive system is. One of our, the crucial roles for our digestive system. So to absorb things, your gut needs to be a little bit leaky, okay? And in order for butyrate to enter your bloodstream, there has to be processes there that allow that to occur. But when we have a, a, a gut lining that is excessively leaky, that allows gut microbes to interact directly with our bloodstream, interact directly with our immune system. And it also allows um, lipopolysaccharides and other bacterial end products that shouldn't be in our bloodstream to enter our bloodstream and drive chronic inflammatory processes. And the two aspects of the standard Western diet that really contribute to abnormal gut um, permeability or so-called leaky gut are number one, fiber deficiency. Okay, so if you are not consuming enough fiber, you are not producing enough short-chain fatty acids. We know that vegans and vegetarians produce far more short-chain fatty acids than omnivores. Fiber gives us short-chain fatty acids. Butyrate provides 70% of the energy to the cells that line our bowel, the enterocytes. So if you have a fiber-deficient gut, you are setting yourself up for increased gut permeability. Okay, you are also setting yourself up for increased gut permeability or leaky gut and everything that um, involves by consuming junk foods. So since the 1950s, the food industry has been using artificial fillers, emulsifiers, stabilizers, flavor enhancers, carboxymethylcellulose, maltodextrin, polysorbate 80. They have been using these chemicals and pumping them into our food chain by the metric ton in order to make their junk food products taste good and stay stable on the shelf. And these junk foods are junk. They shouldn't be in our digestive system. Um, but sadly, in, the, in countries like the US and the UK, these products now make up about 60% of all calories consumed. And not only are these junk foods deficient in the nutrients that we need to survive and thrive and that feed a healthy gut microbiome, they also contain these chemicals like maltodextrin, um, emulsifiers that actively promote the growth of harmful gut bacteria within our gut microbiome and actively degrade the barrier and help yeah. to disrupt the protective layer of mucin that lines our gut, that is the home to our gut microbes and helps to prevent abnormal gut leakiness. So that kind of combination, those two aspects of the standard Western diet really set us up for leaky gut okay and then you add into that the fact that an animal product healthy an animal product rich diet also promotes the growth of bacteria that can potentially cause harm within the digestive system so that's just a little segue on leaky gut um, because it's interesting to hear you mention that 
in the context of dementia and brain health. The conclusions that have come from these studies is one, this is a potential early diagnostic tool. So could we look at um, blood proteins or blood plasma and, and see the, the, what is constituting that plasma and, and identify byproducts of the microbiome and identify whether someone's microbiome is unhealthy and therefore is likely increasing their risk of succumbing to a disease like Alzheimer's disease. Mm. But the second point, which was, is interesting when you talk about the, the probiotic industry, and it was a very uh, sort of industry focused um, conclusion is that we could use bacterial cocktails and prebiotics to feed the good bacteria and protect people from dementia. But it brings the question of should we be doing that or should we just be promoting a better diet as a protective way against diseases like dementia? Well, of course we should. I mean, as we said at the very start of this conversation, the food that we consume is one of the main drivers of disease and disability in high-income countries right now. It's not probiotic supplement deficiency that we have been asked to address when we are looking at the health of, the, of our population, right? So yeah. this, I mean, for you and I and other people who know the effects that a healthy dietary change can have on the health of the gut microbiome, these sorts of conclusions in papers come up time and time again, don't they? Um, yeah. So we, saw, we, we know that if you eat a healthy diverse, unprocessed, predominantly or exclusively plant-based diet, you're ticking all the right boxes for excellent gut microbial health and you are going to foster a gut microbiome that helps you to be a healthier person. This isn't controversial. If you look at the gut microbiome research papers, time and time again, this is the message that we learn. Now, I'll give you another example that reminds you of the example that you just gave me, right? So about, I think about 2019, the American, I think it was in the American Journal of Cardiology, and there was a paper published by a very well-respected, um, a very well-respected group of gut microbiome researchers. So they very aware of the role of the gut microbiome in metabolic syndrome, so hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, obesity, insulin resistance, type two diabetes. They recruited some volunteers. I think they had twenty volunteers, and they decided that rather than addressing their diet and lifestyle that they would see what the effect would be if they gave them a gut microbiome transplant from people with a really healthy gut microbiome. Okay. Okay. So they said about the paper, uh, the research study, really fascinating paper, really deep dive into gut microbiome health, really fascinating, right? But so each of these volunteers had a nasogeginal tube placed. Uh, so it's a very long feeding tube that goes down into your small bowel. And then they were administered a fecal microbial transplant. So a poop transplant. So they took poo feces, which is euphemistically referred to as a gut microbiome transplant okay. and administered it to these volunteers. Now, knowing what we know about gut microbial health and health in general, who did they choose as the donors? Can I guess people on Go a plant-based diet by any chance? They they did. They chose vegans. They recruited, they actively recruited vegans to give the transplants. Okay. And they recorded in that study that they were, and I think the phrase used in the paper was vegan like characteristics within the gut microbiome of these individuals within a few days. And they noticed some minor metabolic benefits within a few days. I think they'd seen a slight reduction. In the, produce, in the production of trimethylamine, which was a beneficial, which is thought to be beneficial. However, the changes didn't last, okay? And at the conclusion of that paper, I, th I think they spoke about, well, look, it worked a little bit, results were a little bit disappointing. Maybe we should be giving these people fecal microbial transplants more regularly. Maybe <laughs> we should be giving them fecal microbial transplants every few weeks. And reading that paper, I'm like tearing my hair out because they've already identified that people who eat a plant-based diet have the optimal gut microbiome that they're trying to yeah. get into these people's digestive systems. We know that when you make the switch to a high fiber plant-based diet, the beneficial effects in your gut microbiome begin to occur within days, within 28 yeah. days, we can see that the production of harmful uh, secondary bile acids, which are carcinogenic, can be you know, cut by more than half. We see that the production of butyrate can increase by more than 150% within 28 days of switching to a plant-based diet. We know that long-term people who eat a plant-based diet, their gut microbes lose the ability to produce excess trimethylamine 
which gets absorbed into your bloodstream and turned into TMAO by your liver, which is important because that's thought to be one of the molecules that contributes to coronary vascular risk. So we know all this. The, you know, and these gut microbial benefits aren't theoretical. The, but yet we're not buying our patients cookbooks, Sam. We're, we're giving them yeah. gut microbial transplants and probiotic powders and pills and you know, you know, supplements that are going to achieve all of those benefits while recognizing that there is some, if we give our patients the knowledge, the kitchen skills, the support, the community support, and these things are all very achievable and patients enjoy them. You know, I recently yeah. had a patient with inflammatory bowel disease, just like you, um, at my clinic and she was doing great. Um, she is one of my patients who has completely embraced this whole food plant-based approach to eating. And she's doing really well. And we had a very positive consultation, biomarkers good, fecal count protecting good. And as she was leaving the room, she said, oh, we got a copy of your book and we're making the goulash hot pot tonight. Oh, I'm really looking one. forward to it. Yeah, and she's like, I'm really looking forward to trying it. And I thought, oh, that's really kind. Thanks very much, I appreciate it. And I got home that evening and I was making dinner and I, and I told this story to my wife. And then it struck me, Sam, no patient has ever said to me in clinic, okay, and I've been in gastroenterology now for 20 years, no patient has ever said to me, oh, Dr. Desmond, I just picked up that new immune suppressant you prescribed. I got it at the pharmacy last night. I'm trying it this evening. Can't wait. <laughs> never yes. happened. I've never had a patient say to me, oh, yeah, great. I'm coming in for a gut microbial transplant on Tuesday. Awesome. I can't, can't wait. wait. I cannot wait for that. You know, now I'm not saying that immune suppressants and gut microbial transplants don't have a role to play, but why aren't we talking to our patients about food? Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that you talked about things like uh, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all linked to the microbiome and those in turn are also linked to dementia. So it's all this, this, this big uh, circle of events. Now um, I know you're a busy man and we could talk about this all day, but um, I'd like to finish by firstly talking about um, you know, the resources that people can, can use to try and adopt this. I, I am a big advocate of, of your book, as we talked about. Um, obviously, you, you are a specialist in gastroenterology, you run clinics, and I feel like the book is a way for somebody who is unable to attend your clinic to get some of that advice and get some points as the best way to try and you know, reset the microbiome and become healthier. And it really has, you know, in my uh, instance, made a huge difference, not just to my gut, but to my, my mood as well. I feel sharper, I feel happier. But um, the question is, for somebody who's wanting to, to uh, embrace this kind of change, obviously there is books like yours and other cookbooks, but do you have any other resources that you'd like to, to share and promote for people who want to try and make these kinds of changes, not necessarily just for their brain health, but for their overall health? Well, we're so lucky now, there are so many resources, you know. Um, so the, the resources that I'm involved with personally, of course, the book is out there. Um, it's probably, it's been out for, since January. So you can, you can probably pick up a copy for about a tenner now if you shop around. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's 10 pounds well spent. Or you can get the <laughs> ebook probably for a fiver, I'd imagine, at this point, you know. Um, so that's a great, res a, a great resource if you've enjoyed the stuff we've talked about today. And in the book, I give a bunch of resources at the back so people can kind of take their plant-based education a little bit further. I mean, there's great websites on the benefits of eating a healthier plant-based diet. So I, I mentioned earlier, Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, pbhp.uk. So I'm proud to be an ambassador for that organization. We've got a ton of resources. We run webinars. Um, we have conferences. If you are a healthcare professional, an allied health professional, or anyone who's interested in this, you can sign up and become a member, and we'll send you all the resources that you need and get you involved in the community. Um, we also have a completely free 21-day plant-based challenge, which you can sign up for at tinyurl.com forward slash plant-based 21. We'll give you recipes and shopping lists. You'll have a Zoom meeting with a registered dietitian every two weeks. We'll support you. Um, if you want to, if you like uh, Netflix, why not tune in, watch the Game Changers, What the Hell, yeah. their forks over knives, get inspired. And just recently with my good friends, um, Stephen and David Flynn, the happy pair, um, who are uh, renowned plant-based chefs, as well as my good friends, Rosie Martin, registered dietitian, and Simone Benner, who's an IBS uh, holistic therapist. Uh, just last month, we launched a new online course called the Gut Health Revolution. And we give people all of the support that they need 
in, as well as a access to this online community of peer support is so important when you're making healthy changes. And not everybody has access in their friends or family network to other people who are determined to improve their health. Um, so we provide that online and you get um, the recipes, meal plans, educational content from me and Rosie. You get healthy lifestyle advice from Stephen and David Flynn at The Happy Pair. And something we didn't talk about today is the importance of mindfulness and stress reduction in yeah. digestive health and helping people to calm the gut-brain axis. Really compelling data on that. So we have a, um, we've built in a mindful meditation course within the course that people can take as an option. Um, so you can learn more about that at alandesmond.com forward slash revolution. Um, but those are just some resources to start, get people started, I guess. And um, I'd just like to finish you know, as well by saying these are all great places to look at. And it's important to think about this the right way as, as well and not think of it as a restrictive change. You know, I think about some of the, my favorite recipes from the book. You know, we have things like um, you can have a spring tofu hash for breakfast. You can have a, an MLT for lunch. You can have sticky tofu for dinner. You get all these wonderful flavors. And so it's not just people think a, a dietary change can mean restricting themselves and not enjoying the food but I, ca I can't say I've had a meal that I didn't really enjoy so I think it's oh, that's, that, that's super kind of you to say that I appreciate that Sam I mean we, we worked hard on those recipes to make sure I mean often when people make the change to a plant-based diet they feel like they've got to be having kale smoothies and yeah. you know and just like turn their approach to food on its complete head but it doesn't it, it, it shouldn't be like that I mean we're so lucky now um, you're very kind to mention some of the recipes in the book. But of course, if you go online right now and Google healthy plant-based recipe or healthy vegan recipe, you probably get about 100 million options. Yeah. And you, you can go out there and you can find food that seems that is familiar to you, looks like the meals you usually enjoy, looks like the comfort foods that you enjoy, but just happen to be made using some using or built from the foods and the ingredients that are known consistently known to benefit our overall health, our digestive health and our neurological health, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, plant-based oils. And you can find recipes that are familiar to you. If you like chicken pot pie, you can have chickpea pot pie. Yeah. If you like to have spaghetti bolognese, but you've usually made it with beef or lamb, you can get a spaghetti bolognese recipe, but now you're using whole wheat pasta and you're using lentils or beans mm instead of the meat and you're eating tastier versions of the meals that you've enjoyed all your life and but just like you've i mean you've explained very nicely the benefits that you've ex you've experienced and those benefits are there for everybody everybody yeah. should be able to enjoy the benefits of eating more unprocessed plant-based meals and it's not about labeling yourself as vegan or vegetarian yeah, or flexitarian or whatever itarian it's just about choosing to build more of your meals, most of your meals, maybe all of your meals from these healthy ingredients, which you can buy at your supermarket very cheaply. And the more you do it, I find the more you crave that kind of food and the more you want to eat healthy because you just want to keep feeling those benefits. Um, so, yeah, well, I'd like to finish then by, by thanking you for joining us today, Arne. It's been a, a really fascinating discussion and I'm sure our listeners will enjoy it as well. So thank you for joining us. Oh, uh, cheers, Sam. It's been a pleasure. I feel like you and I could probably talk for another two or three hours. Yeah, but, 100%. Uh, we, 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 we might lose the audience. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I could I could talk um, particularly because uh, you know I have this personal investment in it. It's just become a really fascinating thing, and I'm I'm always telling people you know you should try this. You 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 know you'll you'll feel so much better, and and when they do, it's amazing to see that they feel the same. Um, but but yeah, thank you very much for joining us, and I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Uh, this has been the NIHR Dementia Researcher Podcast, and we've uh, really enjoyed speaking to Alan Desmond today, and we'll hopefully see you next time. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.